Hey guys, good morning. Welcome to Fellowship of Champions. And I'm giving people a second to jump on. Kristen just finished a powerful worship segment this morning on her page, Kristen Valley Worships. And we're super excited to be here. And as many of you can see, we are at Fellowship of Champions. And it feels really good to be here, but we are definitely missing the faces of our partners, man. And listen, Pastor Edwin, he was playing Kristen's worship through the speakers as I was getting ready to teach, man. And it just felt so good. And it just we just missed our smiling faces. We miss all of you guys. And we want to encourage you guys to stay safe. You know we're praying Psalms 91 over you that no plague shall come nigh your dwelling. And we are encouraging you to make good choices. Um, the Bible says in all you're getting, get an understanding. So we are encouraging you to wear your mask. We are encouraging you to practice social distancing. We are encouraging you um, to treat your body um, as a temple to protect it and then also to be mindful of others. But we're decreeing Psalms 91 over you. No place shall come nigh your dwelling. We are declaring that anybody who has been impacted, that healing springs forth suddenly. We believe the word of the Lord. So good morning, good morning, good morning. I see people are coming in. Tell me where you're watching from. Hashtag live if you're watching live. I see people who I saw somebody who said Pine Bluff. Um, I saw somebody. Thank you, Nitra. I saw somebody who said um, Northwest Arkansas. It ought to be some Northwest Arkansas people in the house. Want to encourage you to share this video. You've already gotten the title and it says it's still harvest time. It's still harvest time. I see we've got Northwest Arkansas, Bentonville. Listen, come on and represent, represent, represent. Pastor Edwin says it's time to do some social media outreach. We got Richmond, Virginia in the house. Listen, we need to understand this. You know, there are many people who are in a hurry to get back to the building. And I miss the building. I miss being with our partners. But let me tell you something. Um, when Jesus was preaching the gospel, he didn't have a building like this. He didn't have Facebook, but he used what he had. And then the New Testament church used what they had. It's always been the will of God that we use what we have. And I believe that Facebook is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. Um, hold on just a second. Babe, we not live on Instagram. Um, I believe that Facebook is a powerful tool um, for us to um, be able to impact people. So don't be afraid to share. Don't be afraid to put it in your story. Um, don't be afraid to invite people to come. We've gotten people who come from all over the country, and including the UK, the Caribbean. Um, and, and so we just don't know. God still is saving people. God is still healing people. God is still delivering people. God is still bringing harvest in. You know, and Jesus said to his disciples, he said, look out on the field and see that the harvest is ripe. So who in your timeline is ripe for an encounter with God? Who in your timeline needs to know that God wants them to prosper and be in health even as their soul prospers, that he has a plan for their victory? Who needs to know that God still heals? Who needs to know that God God still saves and delivers. Who needs to know that? And so it's our responsibility to reach out to people. It's our responsibility. So that's why we do social media outreach. So go ahead and share, 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 share. And listen, I don't know if you watched last week. Did you watch last week? Did you watch last week? Listen, last week we talked about seed strategies and supernatural success. And it has been so important to me to really press into what God is saying. What God is saying. I need to make a little bit of an adjustment. I need to move this. Give me just a second. We'll be right back with you. Had to make a little adjustment. You know what? I think I got so excited that we were here at the church that I forgot to say, hey, we need to set up Instagram. So, you know, Instagram people, we're on our way. We're working that out. Um, but listen. It's still a season of great harvest. It's still a season of great harvest. And so I'm coming back to talk about that. But let, before we do that, let's talk about the announcements. Listen, one of the things I love about Fellowship of Champions is that we are expanding even in a pandemic. We've taken our Tuesday night prayer, which used to just be in our private group. We've made that available on this page at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Somebody anointed to pray who prays the word shows up in prayer. How do you know a prayer? 
is powerful. Did you pray the word? You don't know prayer is powerful because you got goosebumps. You don't know that prayer is powerful because you um had tears. You know that prayer is powerful because you prayed the word because the, the power of God is contained in his word. Um, babe, I moved it over so you can switch it to this one if you needed to. And so um, we are just excited. So come to prayer on Tuesday night. Show up for prayer. Turn it to your neighbor. Show up for prayer. And then on Wednesday night, we have our associate pastor, Pastor Ralph Marlowe, who has been doing some dynamic teaching that will help you. You don't have to be worn out by what's happening in the media. You don't have to be worn out about Zoom meetings. You don't have to be worn out by virtual school. You can be refreshed. You can, you know, there is a grace for whatever season you're in. And so I want to encourage you to show up for prayer on Tuesday, show up for Wednesday night refresh, and then roll back around on Sunday morning. Kristen Valley, who leads us in powerful worship. Shout out to Nigel, who's playing, man. His mute, his the keyboard sounded so beautiful this morning. And then right back here, stay connected. It's your responsibility to stay connected. You know, we cannot, we can make all the these tools available to you. We can do all of that, but what we cannot do for you is make you get online. What we cannot do for you is make you open your Bible. What we cannot do for you is make you care. We pray that you care. We pray that you don't cave in and quit, but we can't make you make that choice. And so we are encouraging you to discipline yourself by practicing consistency. By practicing consistency, it's so important. And so with that being said, we're going to pray and we're going to get in the word. I'm, I need y'all to give some hearts. Your hearts represent praising the Lord this morning. I need you to give some hearts to thank the Lord, to give God praise with much thanksgiving. If he's been a good God for you, I can tell you that you can already praise God because there have been people who have received supernatural harvest this week. I'm going to give you a couple of testimonies and then we're going to pray. First of all, there was a young lady who had been applying for jobs for six months. Somebody say six months months. She had been applying for jobs for six months and she had not gotten a bite. And we began to declare that the people who were underemployed and unemployed would get jobs. And she sent me a message and told me that she, um, she sent me a message and told me that she um, got two job offers in one day. And then she said that since then, she's gotten seven job offers. So she went from having no choices to having choices, multiple. She's got seven choices that she can put before the Lord. Let me tell you something. God has not forgotten you. And then people are sending me um, things saying that they got unexpected money in the mail. And then somebody was telling me that they are print, they're printing some books and the printer didn't do a good job and the printer had to fix the job and not only did the printer fix the job the printer then refunded them all of their money turn and tell your facebook neighbor it is still harvest time we just jumped on instagram those of you who love to watch us there so you can roll on over to instagram Thank goodness. One of the things I appreciate is that Pastor Edwin and I, we have had to learn how to do social media. We've had to learn how to keep both of the devices going and making sure the internet is working and stuff. And we appreciate you that you are so patient and so gracious and so kind that even when there is some kind of technical difficulty, that what you do is you stick with us. And so we want to give you a hand of applause. We want to say thank you. We know that church is different, but how many of you know the power is the same. The way we may be doing church is different, but the power is the same. So I'm going to jump into the message. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to pray and then we're going to go to Amos 9. Amos 9 all right. Most gracious heavenly father, we give you praise with much thanksgiving. You are a great, great God. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you that you are the one who heals all of our diseases. You are the one who forgives all of our sins. You are the one who redeems our life from destruction. You are the one who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercy. You are a good God and you demonstrated your love in that you gave 
gave us Jesus. You so loved us that you gave us your best gift so we could be reconciled to you. And we thank you for the power of reconciliation. We thank you for redemption and we thank you for righteousness. And we thank you for your written word because it instructs us, it corrects us, it reproves us, it shows us the way that we should go. So we thank you that we're never without an answer because we can turn to this written word. We can go to Proverbs and find wisdom. We can look at the gospels and see your reflection. We can see your miracles. We are not left without wisdom. And then we thank you for the Holy Spirit. As Jesus was getting ready to descend, Father, he said to his disciples, I got to go away because I got to get the Holy Spirit in you. And so we thank you for the Holy Spirit in us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead and guide us into all truth. We thank you that you give, you direct us, you instruct us, you show us the way that we should go. We thank you that you search the Father's heart to reveal to us what has been given to us in every season and that you have not forgotten about us. And so as we get ready to get into the word this morning, Father, we thank you for the ability to see, hear, and understand. We thank you that anytime we can see, hear, and understand that we are converted, and when we are converted, healing comes. So we thank you that there is a healing being released in your people's lives regarding peace and regarding your ability to provide. We thank you that every place, every lie of the enemy that has made people think that you don't care about their situation, that you are unbothered by their financial state, that you are unbothered by what is going on. We declare that truth is being illuminated now and your people are being rooted and grounded in truth and we will not be moved. We declare it is harvest time because you said it is harvest time. And so we stand in expectation to receive harvest time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. It's harvest time. I want to go to Amos 9. Very familiar passage of scripture, verses 13 through 15 in the message translation. It says, yes, indeed, it won't be long now, God's decree. Things are going to happen so fast your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of another. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once. Everywhere you look, blessings. Blessings like wine pouring off the mountains and hills. I will make everything right again for my people Israel. Now you should get excited because if you go over to Galatians you know that you have been grafted in and when he makes things right for Israel, you're included in that promise. They'll rebuild their ruined cities. They'll plant vineyards and drink good wine. They'll work their gardens and eat fresh vegetables and I'll plant them. Plant them in their own land and they will never be uprooted from the land that I have given them. God, your God says so. Yes, indeed, it won't be long now. I came to tell you that that it won't be long now is here right now. I came to tell you that it is the time for great harvest. It is the season for great harvest. I have been talking to you guys almost every time I have taught. I have talked to you about how important it is for us to prophetic, to, to respond appropriately to a prophetic word. I have taught you that a prophetic word is a weapon. It is a sword. It is what we use in order to dismantle the strategy of the enemy. Understand that in this time, the strategy of the enemy is running rampant in the area of fear. He wants you to be afraid of COVID and he wants you to be afraid of not having enough. But the Bible tells us that Jesus has healed us and made healing available to us and Jesus has provided for us. Now, I think that this is such an important discussion to have and I thank you guys that you keep sharing the video. Please keep sharing the video and we're going to put the giving up if you want to go ahead and sow into this ministry because Fellowship of Champions is good ground. We've all already seen so much harvest, been able to be a blessing to so many people because of your faithful giving. And so I'm here to tell you that this time of harvest is here now. It is here now. But how many of you know that it is possible for something to be here now right in your face and you miss it because you're not looking in the right direction? 
Um, I have five children, and I can't tell you during the course of having five children how many times I have sent my children to find something and said, hey, go to go look in the dresser. Go look on my nightstand, open the top drawer, and bring me X or bring me, bring me $20. And I can't tell you how many times they've gone in the room, but they did not open the right drawer or look where I told them to look. See, understand that God already has provision in your land. He already has a set place for you. He knows your gifts. He knows your talents. He knows your abilities. He knows the season that you're in. He knows um, your education level. He knows where you stay. He knows the state you live in. He knows the town you live in. He, li he knows the economy, but he has already prepared. He has already prepared your provision. Say, God has already prepared my provision. So God has already prepared your provision. He's created you in his image and given you the ability to do what? To be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, and to exercise dominion. So God created you in his image. I'm not going to recap that. That's the video from last week. That's the teaching from last week. But he created you in his image and he created you with the power to be fruitful. Fruitful. Say, I am fruitful. I am fruitful. He created you with the ability to multiply. Say, I am a multiplier. He created you with the ability to replenish. Say, I am a replenisher. He created you with the ability to subdue. Say, I am a subduer. And he created you with the ability to operate in dominion. Say, I operate in dominion. Now understand, this is what God has said about you. Now the question becomes, what have you said about you? See, God has said you're created in his image. God has said that he has made you fruitful. God has said that he has given you the empowerment to multiply. God has said that you can replenish. God has said that you can subdue. God has said that you have dominion. But what are you saying about you? Because the one thing that cancels out what God is trying to do in your life is when you don't believe God has actually already done it in your life. Did you catch what I said? One thing that will cancel out what God is doing in your life is when you don't believe he's already done it. So you look at your checking account and you don't see yourself as a multiplier. You don't see yourself as fruitful. You look at the uh, what the um, Dow Jones is doing and you don't see yourself as increasing. You don't see yourself as having dominion. You look at the job market and the no's that you're getting and you don't see yourself. And so what you begin to do is you begin to speak about what is happening in the world instead of speaking about what God is saying. When Jesus is talking to his disciples, he says to them, they say, how do we pray? He says, when we pray, pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's literally saying to them, I'm telling you about heaven. I'm telling you that heaven has healing. I'm telling you that heaven has peace. I'm telling you that heaven has salvation. I'm telling you that heaven has dominion. I'm telling you that that belongs to you. Now you've got to make a choice. When you pray, are you going to pray pitiful prayers? I don't know how we go make it. God, do you see me? God, don't you care about me? Or are you going to open your mouth and say, Father, I read in your word that you said it won't be long now. You said that if we sow, that we would reap a harvest. God, I have been a sower. I have been a faithful sower. I have done what you have told me to do. As Chris said in the song before, I may not have been perfect, but I sure have been faithful. I may not have gotten it right 100% of the time, but my heart has been to please you. Now, wait a minute. If your heart hasn't been to please him, you know what you can do right now? You can repent. You can change directions. If your heart hasn't been, if you like, wait a minute, she was, she was, that was sounding good until we got to that point. But the truth of it is my heart hasn't been to, to please him. You know what you should do? Repent. Everybody shout repent, repent and change direction. Now I want to go to Romans 10 and 17 because I think it's an important scripture. I've been telling you that if we're going to receive prophetic words, we have to receive the gift that gives us the prophetic word and we have to have faith. Now, one of the things that Pastor Edwin taught us, I believe it, maybe it was last year, maybe it was this year, he's taught it a lot, but he taught us that it's important for us not to have faith in our faith, but we need to have faith in God's love. 
We need to have faith in God's love. Many of us have been frustrated because we've tried to have faith in our faith. We've tried to have faith in the things that we have done. We have tried to have faith in our resume. We have tried to have faith in our skills. We have tried to have faith in our networking. We have tried to have faith in our degrees. We have tried to have faith in our connections. But God says, no, 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 no. What you need to do is you need to have faith in me. You need to trust that my love has looked out for every area of your life. So let's look at Romans 10 and 17. Romans 10 and 17. Shout hallelujah. See, you need to be excited. I know the world may look like it's crazy, but you should be speaking to the world. You shouldn't just be talking about how crazy the world is going. You should be saying, it is my season of great harvest. You should be sharing every testimony that the Lord is giving you. You should be encouraging people to come on over here and let the Lord be their shepherd. You should be the light in darkness. Isaiah 60 tells us it's going to get dark. It says, but in dark, don't worry about it. Arise and shine. Why? Because your light has come. The word of the Lord has come for your life. So how many of you know that God knew that there was going to be a pandemic? And so how many of you know that God loves you so much that even though he knew it was going to be a pandemic, he gave you a word to anchor you. And that word is, this is the season for great harvest. So he said to you, listen here, there may be some things that come to try to shake you. You may get laid off. They may cut your hours. They may cut off all of these things. It may look like no doors are open, but if you will follow the path that I have set for you, I will cause you to walk in harvest. Now it's important for me to tell you this. As an adult, you have the right to make your own choices. Say, I have the right to make my own choices. You have the right to make your own choices. But I got to tell you this because this is important. You can make your own choices. You can go your own way. You can move to whatever city you want to move to. You can marry whoever you want to marry. You can sow over here when he tells you to sow over there. You can eat this way when he tells you to eat that way. You are an adult. You are a free moral agent. You have um, autonomy. You can make your own choices. But it's important that I tell you this. You have the right to make your own choices, but you will never get God's results doing it your way. You will never get God's results doing it your way. Now, in Romans 10 and 17, it tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The reason that every time I get the opportunity to preach, I keep referring us back to what Pastor Ellen has told us is because I know that whatever you hear the most is where your faith is going to be. So if you hear lack the most, if you hear we not going to make it the most, if you hear I don't know what we doing, I don't know what's happening, and maybe God has left us, maybe God has abandoned us, if that's what you hear the most, that's what you're going to believe. So my assignment every time I get to teach is to keep bringing you back because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now understand in Romans, he's telling us how to have biblical faith. He says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But what you need to understand is that whatever you hear the most is where your faith will be. Whatever you hear the most is where your faith will be. So I want to ask you to consider, what are you hearing when you aren't in Sunday morning service? What are you hearing when you aren't on prayer for 30 minutes? What are you hearing on Wednesday nights, after Wednesday night when you're refreshed? And then we don't come back Thursday, Friday, Saturday, so three days, you all by yourself. What do you, what are you hearing? Because what you hear the most is going to determine where your faith is. So the reason that many of you are shaken, the reason that many of you are anxious, the reason that many of you are frustrated is because you spend more time hearing everything over what God said. And the other part of it is that you have to obey. Tell your neighbor you have to obey. I want to go to Isaiah 119. I want to go to Isaiah 119, and I'm going to keep talking about faith here. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. So back to the illustration with my kids. If my kid comes to me and says, hey, I need $20 to go to the movies. And I say, hey, I have $20 in my dresser drawer, in my top dresser drawer, in the left-hand corner, in the white pouch. 
and they go in there and look in the right hand corner and, and get the red pouch, how many of you know that they're going to be disobedient? They're going to be disappointed because they didn't follow instructions. It's so important that we hear and obey God because God's instructions are designed to cause you to prosper regardless of the economy. In Isaiah 1 and 19, a scripture that we've raised our children on, it says, if you will be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I need you to know that no matter what the economy is doing, no matter who the president is, no matter what is happening, I need you to know that God knows where all the good is located. Tell your neighbor that. Tell your neighbor. Say, God knows where all the good is located. So he says, if you are willing and obedient, God knows where all the good is located. I just want to pause for a second. I just saw her comment. Kenosha Grigsby just commented. We want to stop and give the Lord a sacrificial praise. The other day she was in an accident, got hit by somebody who was texting, had to be pulled out of the car, the airbags deployed, but thank God she is alive. And I want y'all to pray for Kenosha that she has supernatural healing and that she also gets financial recompense because she gets troubled for her trouble. So we just pause and, and pray that over her, that she be fully recovered in her body, that she be fully healed, that she be that she not be anxious when she drives, she not be terrified of accidents, and that she gets full economic compensation for her trouble because the Bible says it's a righteous thing for God to trouble your trouble, right? So now listen, God knows where your good is located. Say, God knows where my good is located. So if God knows where the good is located, why do you want to go your own way? Why do you want to go your own way? You know, I've said this for weeks now that God has been talking to people about their resume and their people who you don't make enough in your job. You need to make more or there or God may know that down the road, your do job is going to downsize. But if God is talking to you about your resume, why are you looking at a certification? If God knows where the good is, follow the path that he has set. I believe that it's so important for us to keep talking about God of the harvest, God of the financial harvest. I think that it's so important for us to keep talking about this because many of you grew up in a church like I did. How many? Let, let me tell you about the church I grew up in. I grew up in a church where every Sunday, no matter what they taught about, they were going to take us to the cross. They were going to build our faith in the message of salvation. They were, I don't care, they could teach about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They could teach about Esther. They could teach about Noah. But when they got through, they were going to take us to the cross. That faith comes by hearing. They were going to tell us that he died all night Friday night. They were going to tell us that he died all day Saturday. They were going to tell us that he died all night Saturday night. And they were going to tell us that early Sunday morning he got up. You understand that many of us were like, why do they keep taking us to the cross every week? They were building our faith because most of us did not accept Jesus the very first time we heard the gospel preach. Most of us kept hearing, kept hearing hearing, kept hearing, kept hearing. And if you grew up in church, you were hearing before you even knew that you were hearing. You knew, I love what Chandra said. She said every single Sunday, she said church didn't even count if Jesus didn't go to the cross in a sermon. Why? They were building faith that Jesus is our savior, right? Now, what has to happen is that when I thought, taught the 31 days of healing, the 30 days of healing, I found that same thing to be true. That when I would post about healing every single day, when I would start the day with a declaration, when I would end the day with a confession, and I mean with a devotional, when I would tell testimony, when we would go live, what I found is that as we kept teaching about healing, what started to happen? People started to get healed. So if we teach about salvation, then people get saved. If we teach about seed time, then people sow. If we teach about healing, then people get healed. What I want to do for you is when we think about harvest, I want you to expand harvest to be an all-encompassing message. And I want you to expand salvation to be an all-encompassing message. When the Bible says that Jesus was saved us, the Bible 
Bible is telling us Jesus did not just save us to go to heaven. Tell your neighbor, you are not just saved to go to heaven. You are not just saved to go to heaven. The work that Jesus did, it was final and it was complete. And what Jesus did is that he, first of all, he restored our identity. Because of sin, we were separated from God and Jesus came and he dealt with our separation. He repaired that breach. There was a breach between God and man because of Adam and Eve's sin. He repaired that. But understand that when when he gave us back our identity, somebody all got to get excited because if you're born again, you got your identity back. What does that mean? If you're born again, whatever you've been calling yourself that God didn't tell you, that's not who you are. It says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So when you were born again, you got your identity back. You are not just saved to go to heaven. This salvation that Jesus did on the cross, it deals with every area of your life, the salvation that God has given us through the Lord Jesus Christ deals with every area of our life, including our money, including our money. See, contrary to a lot of religious teaching, God ain't crazy. God knows that you live in this earth realm and God knows you need money to live. The Bible says in Haggai, in Haggai 2, it says the gold and the silver are his. So literally what he did is through Jesus Christ, he saved you. He got your identity right. That's the most important thing, to know who you are, to know that you belong to the Father, to know that through Jesus Christ you have been reconciled. And then he gave you everything else. Say he's already given me everything else. I want to go to Romans 8 and 32. Listen, as you can tell, I'm not here to teach and give you four points. I'm here to stir you up so you will put your faith in this salvation that God has given you, that you will begin to open up your mouth and not just make confessions, guys, but you will begin to move into a realm of extreme obedience, that you will begin to move into a realm where disobeying God is not an option to you, where you will begin to move in a realm where you will stop wrestling with God about his instructions where you will begin to see that everything that God has given you, he has given you because he loves you and he is not withholding any good from you. In fact, he knows where the good is. He knows that you wouldn't be able to find it by yourself. He gave you Jesus. He gave you the word. He gave you the Holy Ghost. He gave you pastors after his own heart. So you did not have to be stuck. So let's look at Romans 8 and 32. Romans 8 and 32. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, I need you to stop and just give God some praise. Some of you may need to get up off that couch, get up off that bar, and you need to just give God some praise because you have not been properly stared and come into a revelation that there is no lack in God and that God is not withholding anything good from you. He knows you need money to live. And he's so mindful of you, Fellowship of Champions, that he had our man of God in November say to us, it is the season of great harvest. But I also got to tell you this. It's the season of great harvest, but it's also not the time to stop sowing. Why? Because we sow because we're expecting harvest. Because that scripture talks about we want to get to the point that there is no gap in harvest. We literally want to have so much seed in the ground that when we turn around, it's a new harvest is coming up and we still haven't extinguished the old harvest. Come on, guys. That is how God wants us to live because how can we be a blessing to the world around us when we're struggling, when we don't know where we go get gas from, when we don't know um, how we're going to pay our light bill? How can we be a blessing? We're called to be distinctively different in the world and not just because we wear long skirts and don't cut our hair. We are called to make a difference. We are called to make a difference. I love what Dexter say Dex said he done got up and started walking because he couldn't even listen to this sitting down this the bible says that the holy ghost it will he will stare you he will quicken your mortal body and i want to tell you not only will he cause you to praise he'll cause you to fix that resume he'll cause you to go ahead and apply for that job he'll cause you to open up that savings account he'll cause you to go ahead and learn about options he'll cause you to go ahead and get that certification he'll cause you to humble yourself and go back to a job that he didn't tell you to leave he 
will quicken you because he knows where the good is located. Amen. Now I want to look at, hallelujah. I want to look at Romans 8 and 32. Romans 8 and 32. Now, before I read Romans 8 and 32, let's just revisit. You don't have to turn to it, but let's revisit John 3.16. John 3.16 tells us what? It says, for God so what? For God so loved the world. Are you in the world? That means you too, right? So for God so loved, I need you to put your name in there. So for God so loved Sean Strickland that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when God is talking about perishing here, he's not just talking about eternity. He doesn't want you to perish in this life. He doesn't want you to get evicted. He doesn't want your car to be repossessed. He doesn't want you to have a headache every single day because you don't know where the money's coming from. He doesn't want you mad at your kids because their shoes got too little as though they made themselves grow. So for God so loved Edwin Strickland. I just read that. For God so loved Kimberly Bennett Dennis. For God so loved Kristen Valley that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. So are you a whosoever? If you're a whosoever, you need to stand up and act like it. It says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, I like to use this illustration because I have five kids right here. You must be deeply loved by God. Because God gave his son for you. It's one of the reasons I hate when we teach that it does that it's not about you. No, no, no. It's not just about you, but it's also, but it is about you. It's so about you that God sent his only begotten son to get you. It's so about you that his perfect son died on the cross for you. Because you are a whosoever. Now, I want you to think about this as a parent. Who would you put your kid on the cross for? I've taught this before because I think it's such a powerful concept. Who would you put your kid on the cross for? How many of you would take your perfect, never sin, always obedient son and put them on the cross for some people that you know that gum well not going to do most of the stuff that you say? They're going to deny your existence. They're going to say they don't need God. They're going to think that they're smarter than they are. Can you imagine how deeply you would have to love a people in order to put your perfect son on the cross for them? His only begotten son. So God give, God is the ultimate sower. That's how God knows that in order to receive a harvest, you got to sow. He sows a son in order to get many sons. So God did not sow Jesus because he was looking for just servants. He was looking for sons who would serve. So God gives his perfect son for whosoever that will believe. You ought to be praising the Lord for that. You think of all the times, all of us, all the times we've gone our own way, all the times that we've gone astray, all the times that we've forgotten how he blessed us. He blessed us on Friday and then on Saturday we complained. But he sold a son to get many sons. God is the ultimate sower. That's how we know seed time and harvest works. That's how you understand that when God asks you to sow, it's never because he's taking something from you. It's always because he's looking to multiply. God has one son. He says, I'm not satisfied with one son. I want many sons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send that one son to make an exchange so I can have many sons. Do we have that concept? Then in Romans 8 and 32, now that we put this sacrifice of Jesus in proper perspective, this perfect son never sinned, literally when he is going before and the people are talking to him and Pilate is trying to get him to say, he could have said, I'm not guilty. But if he says, I'm not guilty, then that means the guilt stays on us. So he won't open his mouth. They beat him. They stripe his back. They tear his back open, 39 stripes, so you can be healed. The Bible says for his sakes, for our sakes, he became poor. 
poor that we might become rich. He became sin that we might become righteous. He became everything that we were so we could become everything that he was. Come on, you ought to, if you begin to understand what God has done, it will change your perspective. It will get rid of that raggedy thinking that God is not interested in you, that God does not care about you, that God is not mindful of you, that God does not care that you work a job that doesn't pay enough or stresses you out or isn't good for your skill set. You don't understand God loved you so much that he gave a son to get you as a son. Now the Bible says that since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? What we have done is we've heard about salvation so much, we've made that a little thing. Oh, he just saved us. No, when he saved us, he gave us everything else. He gave me back my identity. He gave me back the right to go boldly to the Father, to the throne and receive mercy. He gave me the ability to speak a thing and see it come to pass. He gave me access to the Holy Spirit so I could know which way to go. He gave everything to get me me back. And since he did not spare his son, won't he give you everything else? The reason that many of us do not have a successful faith walk is because our faith is in our faith instead of in his love. Our faith must be rooted and grounded in the he loved us so much that he came for us. He loves you so much that he came for you. He loves you so much that he was unwilling to let you get what your disobedience says you deserve. So he loves you that much. Our faith cannot be in our faith, how much I believe, how much I know, how much I've sown. Yeah, I want you to think about this. Even in, even in sowing, I want to use this example. When my, my faith must become this, God loves me so much that he gave me a system called seed time and harvest to ensure that I always have harvest. And then he loves me so much that he gave me seed and bread. So God loves me so much that he gives me everything I need. And then he asked me to give some of it back so he can give me more what I need. Wait, well, let's go. Come on. Let's go to Galatians. I mean, let's go to second Corinthians and then I'm about to be out your hair. Pastor Ellen, go come on over here and close us up. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? The deception and the lie is either that God doesn't care about you or that your faith needs to be in your faith. No, my faith is rooted in his love. So then when I go over here and I read, I'm, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, starting with the sixth verse out of the Amplified. So when I begin to understand that every instruction, that when God tells me not to date somebody, it's because he loves me. When God tells me not to move to that city, it's because he loves me. When God tells me not to say certain stuff about myself, it's because he loves me. When God tells me to step out and do a certain thing, it's because he loves me. Everything that he does for me, he's done it in his love and he proved it first. Tell your neighbor, say he went first. He went first. He created earth because he wanted a family. He wanted sons. Those sons messed up. He sent a perfect son to get all the sons back. He did everything because his love. He went first. Turn it to your neighbor, say he went first. You're talking about how can I trust God? He went first for God so loved the world. He's been going first. In fact, the very seed that he asked you for that you struggle to give, he gave it to you. He, you use his oxygen. You use his strength to work. You use his mental capacity to be able to do all of those things. He's always gone first. He walks the path first to make sure that it works. That's good. That's good. Now, what have you been fighting God about? 
What have you been fighting God about? Who have you been unwilling to forgive? I just felt that by the Holy Ghost. Some of you, you're still mad at somebody. You're still mad at a boss who mistreated you. You're still mad at a parent who slighted you. You're still upset. Who are you? Yourself. You won't forgive yourself. What, what are you still holding on to that he's like, come and make the exchange because I went first and I'm telling you that you can't go where you want to go walking your own path. Those dreams I put in your heart, you can't get there doing it your own way. Yeah, I know you want a house. I know exactly how to get you one. Yeah, I know that you want to get out of debt. I know exactly how to get you there. Why do you keep trying to go your own way, sweetheart? Why do you keep doing things your own way? How many times are you going to walk around this mountain of stubbornness, this mountain of pride, this mountain of falling over your feet? And every time you do it, every time you mess up, every time you come up short, every time you don't listen, when you call out to him, what does he do? He comes to rescue you because he's a good, good father. Some of us, if we stop and think about it, we're blown away because we know we have not received what we deserve because even when we've done our own thing, he's worked it for our good. He told you not to spend the money and then he still raised up somebody to help you even though you spent the money. You acted a fool on that job, but he still gave you another one. You didn't do right when you were in school the first time, but he gave you grace and let you back in. How many times have you and I, see, it's not God whose love is at stake. It's not God who's trying, hasn't to prove anything. He keeps coming. He keeps pursuing. He keeps showing up. He keeps coming with grace. He keeps coming with mercy. He keeps coming with favor. And so he's like, but if you would ever understand how much I love you, I wouldn't have to wrestle you to get you to go my own, to go my way. So then I understand that when he gives me a system called seed time and harvest, and when he raises up a man after his own heart that begins to say, it's your season of great harvest. It's not because he's trying to make me look like a fool. It's because he knows where all the good is. Now let's look at Romans. I mean, let's look at second Corinthians nine and six, and let's look at it from the perspective of love. Now, God has given us this system of seed, time, and harvest, not because he's trying to take from us. In fact, God is so gracious that he's given us the Holy Spirit. So even if someone tries to take from us with an ill intent, they can't even get away with it. Because even if we give from the right heart and they were trying to run a hustle, God is still going to bless us. He's a good father. It says, now remember this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He's saying, look here, beloved. I've given you the power to choose your harvest. And he who sows generously that blessings may come to others will also reap generously and be blessed. He says, let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he decided in his heart, not grudgingly or compulsively. Now, I want to insert this right here because we usually use this with money. But what if you added in obedience in this too? What if you made obedience a seed? Now, remember this, he who sows his obedience sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows his obedience generously, that blessings may come to others, will also reap generously and be blessed. Let each one give. Let each one obey thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he decided in his heart. I want to ask you something that maybe nobody's ever asked you before. Have you actually decided to obey God? Have you made a decision to obey God or is your decision still optional based on how you feel today? Are you a, a consistent sower or do you just sow when it feels like? Are you a consistent obeyer or do you just, you know, are you consistent at keeping your mouth closed? Have you already decided that you're not going to cuss them out because you love him so much? It's not that they don't deserve to be cussed out, but have you just decided I've already thoughtfully, I've already purposely set in my heart to obey him and I am not going to obey him grudgingly. I'm not going to obey him under compulsion. So I'm going to break up with this system of going my my own way getting myself in trouble and then feeling compelled to obey because I need something to turn around I'm just gonna make a decision to obey God I'm just gonna make a decision to be generous in my obedience to God here's the thing I found many of you want to give your money but you haven't given your obedience and many of you want to give your obedience in other areas but you won't give your money I'm telling you you got to bring the whole picture together the Bible says because he gave a son for a son and the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered so if Jesus had to learn through obedience by crucifying his flesh guess what I got to do guess what you got to do 
Now, let's just keep putting obedience there. Let each one obey thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So God loves the person who cheerfully gives him their obedience. That goes right back to Isaiah 1 and 19. If I'm willing and obedient, I'll eat the good of the land. And some of us have been frustrated sometimes because you've been frustrated about why you haven't had increase because you've done what he said, but you did it with such a stank attitude. And if any parent out here just is willing to admit that when your kids do stuff with stank attitudes, it really rubs you the wrong way. And it says, listen, it says, let each one obey. Let each one give him obedience thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves the cheerful giver and delights the one whose heart is in his gift. Has your obedience become a gift? Because he delights when your heart is in your gift. And God is able to make all grace, all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance, come to you in abundance so that you may always, somebody shall always. He says, this is what you will do if you would present your life and then your money. Your life and then your money, not your money instead of your life, not your life instead of your money. He says, if you would bring that to me and you would put your heart in your giving and you would present your obedience to me as a gift, here's the promise. Here's the harvest I'm going to give to you. I'm going to make all grace. What's all grace, Sean Strickland? It's every favor and every earthly blessing. I'm going to tell you to apply for a job that I know you don't qualify for, but I've already set somebody there who's going to say yes because I told them to. They're going to train you and they're going to mentor you. Why? Because you brought your obedience to me as a gift. And now what I'm about to do for you is I'm making all grace, every favor and every earthly blessing. Say all grace. Come on. You ought to get stared up about what your obedience does. He says so that you may always under all circumstances. Let me ask you something. Is a famine a circumstance? Is a recession a circumstance? Is a pandemic a, a, a circumstance? He says, so that you may always, under all circumstance, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to bring me your whole life. I want you to stop compartmentalizing your life. I want you to stop giving me your Sunday, giving me your Tuesday, giving me your Wednesday and trying to manage the rest of the time. I want you to bring your marriage to me. I want you to bring your anxiety to me. I want you to bring your mindset to me. I want you to bring your money to me, not just the tithe, but the rest of it. I want you to bring it all to me and I want you to present it to me as a gift because if you will bring me all of you, I will give you all of me and I will make all grace abound to your account. I will give you every blessing and every favor and it will not matter no matter what the circumstance is. No one will be able to stop you just as I stood with, jo um, with, jo um, with Joshua and they could not stop him. They will not be able to stop you. They will try to stop you because you are black. They will try to stop you because you are a woman. They will try to stop you because you have been divorced. They will try to stop you because of your past but all grace and favor and earth earthly blessing will be working on your behalf, causing you to be self-sufficient in my sufficiency. And somebody say, and cause he wasn't even done. That was good, but he wasn't even done. He says, and, and I'm going to do all of that for you. And somebody say, and cause and ties something together. It ties something together. He says, and you will have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. He says, I want harvest to flow in you in such a way because you have brought your whole life into partnership with me that no matter what your gender, no matter what your race, no matter what your background, no matter who your mama was, no matter where you are right now, no matter your age, that if you will bring your life to me, your whole life, not just your Sunday life, not just your Bible study with Ralph life, but your entire life, if you will present your whole life to me as a gift, if you will give it to me in the same attitude that Jesus gave his life for you, he says, I will make all grace abound to you and it won't matter what the circumstance is. So I came to tell you it's still harvest time. Come on, Pastor Edwin. I came to tell you that it's still harvest time. I came to tell you that it's still harvest time and not only is he going to take good care of me, 
he going to take such good care of me that I'm going to be able to do charitable work. And so Pastor Elwin is coming to wrap this thing up. I hope you were blessed by that. I want to encourage you to give this morning. I want to encourage you to start by giving your life. I know some of you accepted Jesus. Maybe you did it when you were eight, when you were 13, when you were 17. But now I'm asking you, give your whole life. Give your, them parts you've been trying to manage, that relationship that you've had in secret. You know, that friend that he told you to walk away from, that situation. Bring your whole life. Bring it as a gift. And watch him pour out all grace, favor, and earthly blessing. Y'all be blessed. All right. I hope y'all enjoyed Pastor Sean this morning. I certainly did. I couldn't type fast enough in the comment sections for all the stuff that she was saying. Uh, just remember, you know, I want to I want to just end this broadcast by saying, make sure you're obeying God. You know, she talked about it still being harvest time. She talked about all the wonderful things that God wants to do. But I want to remind you that all of those are encapsulated in the fact that you are obeying God. God is, 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 is long suffering. God is faithful. Uh, God is patient, but he still requires obedience. He still requires obedience. And one of the things that we've been talking about for the last several weeks is that there are some there are four key things that I believe each one of us can do that puts us in line to make sure we are obeying God. Number one, we talked about this. We said you got to learn to tame your thoughts. You got to be, you got to get in control of your thought life. You got to uh, let your mind line up with the word of God. And then we said, once you learn to do that, then you got to learn to tame your tongue. You got to watch what you say. There's so much stuff going on in the media, so much crazy stuff. And it's not like the media is, is, is fake news, as some would say. There is really some crazy stuff going on, and the media is doing their job in reporting it. But we have to make sure that when we see it, and we hear it, that we don't allow it to become our reality and we begin to say all of the crazy stuff uh, that is being reported. It is true, but it is not the truth. Amen? And so we got to learn how to tame our thoughts. We got to learn how to tame our tongue. And then number three, we got to learn how to tame our heart. Amen? That's our temperament. We got to make sure that we are walking in love. Remember, Pastor was talking about that. We can't have faith in our faith. We got to have faith in in how much God loves us. And in doing so, that allows us to reciprocate that love uh, to others. And so we got to make sure that our temperament, our heart is being tamed. It's not becoming hard or stony. And then number four, we have to make sure that we learn to tame our environment. Listen, during this season, when you are ready to manifest the things that God has for you, there may be some people who are what I call well-meaning people in your life who are trying to talk you out of what God has promised you, not because they're mean or evil, but because they don't want you to get your feelings hurt. They won't want you to have your expectations set too high. You may have to put those people on the sideline. You may have to put those people on the shelf. You may have to reduce your time with those people, but get yourself around some faith-filled people, some people who are going to push you, some people who are going to believe with you, you and some people who are saying, yes, if God said it, you can see it. Because the Bible says that whosoever believe it, that they will be able to see the manifestation of those things which they believe. Amen. And so that's all I wanted to say. I want to remind you uh, not to forget about Mindset Monday on Monday at noon. Don't forget about Bible study on Tuesday night at eight. Don't forget about, I mean, prayer on tu prayer Tuesday night at 8. Don't forget about Bible study on Wednesday at 8.30. And then meet us back here on Sunday at 9.30 with Kristen Valley Worships. Uh, it was, uh, as you can tell, we we're in our church this morning broadcasting. Uh, I had Kristen playing through uh, the system. It was so good to hear her voice coming out of the speakers again. Listen, you want to tune in and you want to hear her. And then come back here next week. We don't know what Pastor Sean has planned for us. But what we do know is that it's going to be really, really good. Amen. It's going to be really really good and we can't wait to hear her again next week so if you want to sow into the ministry uh, i believe they've put that on your on the broadcast you can do that listen if you want to sow into pastor sean's life sow into her life listen if god tells you to sow into somebody's life this week if it's at the grocery store the gas station starbucks where, walmart wherever you may be if the lord puts upon your heart to do a what we call a mitzvah a good deed for someone to bless someone 
Do it. Why? Because God already knows what's behind that. He already knows what blessing he has attached to your obedience, okay? So make sure you're obeying God. Stay safe. As we always say, make sure you wear your mask. Make sure you're social distancing. Make sure you're following all the proper uh, hand washing uh, rules and regiments. Listen, let's stay safe out there. We can bring an end to COVID-19 through our prayers and through our discipline. Amen. So let's do that. Let's take care of everybody. Uh, keep those around us safe. Keep yourself safe so we can really get back to what we call normal so we can begin to meet and gather once again. Okay. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful week. Y'all take care.